first of all, I want to welcome everybody to day two of the symposium on computing for the common good, which is sponsored by the College of Information and Computer Sciences at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And thank you all for joining us today. So my name is Jim Carosa. I'm a, a longtime professor in the College of Information and Computer Sciences. My research interests are in all areas of, of computer networking, um, but I think also more broadly in lots of different areas in computer science. I'm really happy to be back on campus at the University of Massachusetts following five years uh, in Washington um, at the National Science Foundation and the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Now on our screen today, uh, you should be able to see uh, today's schedule of events. And we're really fortunate to be able to start off our day today um, with a keynote address. And I'll introduce Fran Berman, our speaker, in just a minute. I want to say also, there's going to be plenty of time for audience um, questions and answers and also discussion. So following the keynote address, we're going to take a short break, then resume our program at 1.30 uh, with a series of faculty research, research talks, sort of par paralleling what we did yesterday. And today's talks are going to cover a core data science topic spanning data privacy, computer vision, causal inference, cognitive neuroscience, HPC on graphical data, information retrieval, and NLP. And there again, it's going to be plenty of time for questions and answers and, and discussion uh, there as well. And then finally, uh, after a break, after those um, uh, research sessions, we're going to have our third and, and, and final keynote speaker uh, and that's going to be uh, me. So I, I hope you'll all stay tuned in for that and hope you'll find that interesting. Something you won't want to miss as the saying goes. So um, it, it's really my great pleasure to introduce our, our keynote speaker leading off today. She's a good friend of mine and a colleague and I've had a great pleasure and honor to have known Fran for quite some time. So Fran Berman is uh, the Edward P. Hamilton Distinguished Professor of Computer Science at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for uh, Internet and Society at Harvard. She just completed the academic 2019-2020 year as the Katherine Hampson Bethel Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. Now, uh, Fran's the former uh, director of the San Diego Supercomputer Center, where she was the first holder of the HPC Endowed Chair at UCSD. She's a former VP for research uh, at RPI. And probably most importantly, she's a long-term data scientist. She was one of the founders, a longtime uh, visionary leader of the Research Data Alliance, which is a community-driven initiative launched back in 2012, 2013, with the support of the EU, uh, the United States government, including the National Science Foundation. And I got to work really closely with Fran on that. Uh, and the Australian governments. And um, the RDA, Research Data Alliance, uh, has the goal of building the social and technical infrastructure to enable open sharing and research of, uh, and reuse of research data. It's got more than now 10,000 members from 145 countries. And RDA provides sort of a neutral meeting space where members can come together to develop and adopt infrastructure that promotes data sharing and data driven. Uh, research. Now, Fran's current work focuses on the social and environmental impacts of information technology, and in particular, the Internet of Things. And she's going to be talking about both of those aspects in her talk today. And she's been exploring sort of the overarching uh, ecosystem that's needed to guide the development of information technologies that maximize benefits, minimize risks, and promote individual protections, the public interest, and planetary responsibility. And that's really a mission and a passion that Fran has had for a long time. And they're becoming broadly known today as public interest technology, PIT, which she'll say a word about. Um, so uh, I'm going to wrap this up, but uh, I, I want to say a word about her achievement and honors. And actually, they're so long that if I went through them all, she'd have no time left to talk. So I'm going to be brief. Uh, Fran was the uh, first recipient of the AC, joint ACM and IEEE um, uh, Ken Kennedy Award for Influential Leadership in the Design, Development, and Deployment of National Scale Cyber Infrastructure. I will tell you personally, having been involved in National Scale Cyber Infrastructure, uh, Fran and her work at, uh, at UCSD and the San Diego Supercomputer Center is just 
uh, was, was really, really pioneering work. In 2015, Fran was nominated by President Obama, confirmed by the Senate to become a member of the National Council on the Humanities. She's been active in many uh, service leadership roles nationally within the computing community, including uh, co-chairing the NSF's Size Advisory Committee for many years, where I worked very closely with her and had the privilege and a lot of fun of, of working with her. Fran's a member of the Board of Trustees of the Sloan Foundation, and she's a fellow of the AAAS, the National Academy of Public Administration, the ACM, uh, and the IEEE. So Fran, I'm sorry to use up so much of your time already, uh, but I kept it as, as short as I could, and I wanted to uh, just touch on a few highlights of the amazing things that you've done. And on behalf of all of us, on behalf of the college uh, and all the members, I want to I wanna thank you for being here and uh, joining us today. So I'm going to turn it over to Fran in just a second, but just a reminder about uh, Fran's talk and the Zoom seminar that we're in now. So we're going to be running this in Zoom webinar mode. And that means that uh, all of us are not going to be able to actually turn on our microphones uh, or our video cameras, but we really do encourage audience questions and participation. And so to do that, if you want to submit a question or a comment, use the Q&A feature of, of, of Zoom down on the bottom, and then uh, you'll get the, uh, the chat window over on the, on the right-hand side. Click on the Q&A button, which should appear. Uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and that's going to open up a window where you can type in your question. So Fran's keynote is entitled, Building the Internet of Things uh, for the Common Good, a very, very appropriate talk for this symposium and for the mission uh, of our college. So please join me. Um, we can all clap or thumbs up or press our buttons for thumbs up. Please join me in welcoming uh, Fran Berman. Fran, thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much, Jim. Let me see if I can uh, get you all on my slides. The joys of Zoom. There you go. And, and, and let me know, can you see that all right? Yes. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jim, for the generous introduction. And, um, you know, it's not often that, uh, that you get to be introduced by one of your personal superheroes. So. Um, I'm, I really appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to your talk as well, Jim. Um, and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I've been so impressed and um, uh, inspired by a lot of what people have been saying at this symposium and a lot of the focus on computing for the common good uh, at UMass. So I hope to contribute a little bit by this talk and, and really sharing some of the thoughts that I have had um, about about computing for the common good and how we might build our technologies to promote the common good. So let's talk today a little bit about the relationship between society and technology. And one of the things I wanna talk about is how complex it is to develop technology for the common good. As you might expect, it's a story of kind of rewards and risks and predictable outcomes and unanticipated consequences, twists and turns. And what it demonstrates is that a healthy society needs a synergy. And that's a synergy of technological innovation and social responsibility. Um, so let's get started. So here we are, March 17th, uh, around uh, noon ET, somewhere in the coronaverse. And we are on Zoom. We have spent a year meeting with each other uh, not knowing if we were wearing shoes and, um, and using the technologies afforded to us by cyberspace to work, uh, to go to school, to order groceries, uh, to have Christmas celebrations with uh, people far away and to do things that we would not ordinarily have done. In the last year, if not before, did, these digital technologies have, been, have become critical infrastructure. And because of that, um, there are, we have social responsibility to think about how to best target them. We, these uh, digital technologies are bringing um, unimaginable amounts of data. As of last year, there were about 50 zettabytes of data that's sent to the 21st. We expect there to be uh, more than three times as much in the next five years. Our relationships these days are tech powered. 
Um, we interact in person, but lots of times we interact in cyberspace. And an interesting statistic, I think, is that there's almost seven connected devices for every human on Earth. And if you think about the number of computers and cell phones and Fitbits and smart doorbells and, you know, all of the kinds of things that you have in your life, there's a lot of them. And so one of the things to think about is um, the fact that this technological world we all live in is really driven by the Internet of Things. And if you think about the IoT broadly, it's all of our connected sensors and cameras and computers, our smart systems, our, our connected baby monitors, our cars, and all kinds of other technologies. The things in the IoT share data. They often work together to make decisions and sometimes operate autonomous in the, in the, autonomously in the background. So you might think about you know, what your personal IoT looks like. Uh, maybe you have a car that connects to the internet uh, and does a number of things autonomously. Maybe you have a Fitbit. Maybe you or a relative or a friend has a connected implantable medical device. Uh, maybe some of your appliances are smart. Maybe your vacuum cleaner figures out the geography of your home and hears from you over your smartphone uh, and can navigate that. Maybe your baby monitor is connected. And so all of these devices, the devices that all of us use every day, um, make decisions, they optimize and they customize and they personalize for us and they make life more efficient. They monitor us and they have smarts. And in fact, the IoT empowers people through these smarts. So they empower people through technology and technology through intelligence. And that gives us both a vision and it also has its downsides as well. Oops. So, you know, where did this come from? And, and all of us, of course, have been uh, participating in and building these different technologies that came together uh, from the IoT over the last few decades. There have been a, a huge number of technology advances, artificial intelligence and data science, cloud computing, uh, advances in small scale devices and power solutions, network innovations, but there's also been so social drivers. So technology has really become uh, a fundamental platform for social infrastructure. Um, our businesses these days are data driven and data becomes a real competitive advantage. Um, in the absence of a lot of consumer protections, it's a wild west out there for innovation and innovation has thrived in a lot of the devices and systems that we use. And of course the COVID pandemic has made um, all of these devices more important to our lives and provided sometimes the only way we can uh, connect with each other. And so the IoT has really become really important and it's not going away. So the IoT really underscores the new normal, which is um, basically ubiquitous critical infrastructure that will drive um, all of our activities when we go back to onsite, when we go back to each other, and it's having a tremendous economic impact. It's changing the economy of all kinds of things, including the surveillance market and the way we live our lives. And so, you know, one question we might have is how do we ensure that the IoT promotes the common good? And um, there are some pretty wonderful things that have happened as a result of the IoT. You know, we've thought about the rise of robotics in manufacturing, but robotics is also being used by the military in disaster response to go in and save people in toxic environments or in our surgical rooms um, where surgeons can um, use robotic um, instruments to perform very precise surgery, whether they're in the same room or hundreds of miles away. If you had an avocado last week, it may have been grown on a smart farm, a place where um, you can, at the resolution of a single plant, decide how much nitrogen or fertilizer or water the plants need and use a differential approach to watering or fertilizing or maximizing the yield of your field. So there have been a number of incredible innovations and positives um, that have been brought to us by devices and systems in the internet of things. At the same time, we've seen a lot of challenges and a lot of risks from uh, these devices. 
And you only have to, you know, read the paper every week on a regular basis and see uh, the number of devices uh, that have been hacked or the number of vulnerabilities that have been found um, in these devices. We've seen people um, scream at babies and threaten their parents through connected baby monitors. We've seen cyber vulnerabilities in pacemakers um, that could kill people and, and, and none of them have yet. Um, we've seen a national discussion on facial recognition and mass surveillance, which is becoming uh, more and more prevalent. Uh, when is it protective? When is it intrusive? When is it wrong? Uh, when does it put people at risk? And so, you know, in some sense, when we think about all of these devices and all of these systems, and we think about promoting the common good, what we really want to do is maximize the benefits and minimize the risks. Now, one of the things that um, should make us feel a little bit better is, you know, as, um, as a people, as a society, we have been here before. And one only needs to look at history um, to, to um, recognize that technology innovation always leads, and then society course corrects. And um, it's always the case that because we don't have experience with new technologies, you know, we race ahead and we try to figure out what's going on. And then next, you, it comes the social framework and the ethical guidelines. And there was a sociologist um, by the name of William Ogden that actually introduced this term uh, in the 1920s called cultural lag. So the culture has to really catch up. And you only need to kind of look at the industrial revolution to see how important and, and, how, uh, and how, important about how important that is. Manchester, England, um, during the Industrial Revolution became an incredibly busy metropolis because of the cotton industry. Before that in England, um, cotton had been kind of a cottage industry and it also had been exports from other places in the world. Um, but during the Industrial Revolution, the rise of factories and the rise on the ability to actually manufacture cotton really made a huge difference. And um, you only have to kind of look at this um, really interesting picture and the comment by Alexis de Tocqueville about a thick black smoke covers the city. Um, in the semi-daylight, uh, 300,000 people work ceaselessly. And what really happened during the Industrial Revolution and in Cottonopolis is in those factories, you saw a lot of children and women working. And you saw new pollution that had never been in these areas before. And because of that, in England at that time, you saw some of the first child labor laws. And so that children could do something other than work in these factories essentially 24 seven. And you saw some of the first environmental laws. And so, you know, this is a great example of society catching up when innovation has kind of taken us forward. So we can really mitigate the risks and maximize the benefits. And that's what's happening now. Um, today uh, in the information age with all of these digital technologies that have become critical infrastructure, it's really important for us to think about what should we do with these innovations? What are the benefits of them? And how can we make sure that um, the risks are not catastrophic and that the risks are minimized? And that's sort of part of the job we have when we think about promoting the common good. Now, I think the bottom line from all of this is it, that we've learned through history and that we need to put it to work now is that how we build and manage the internet of things and all of these digital technology matters. And all of the technical architectures that we use, the products and the services and all of these things, they all have societal implications. They impact the environment, they impact society and our protections, they impact the economy, they imp impact a whole slew of things. And when we do create social controls, they have to be embedded in our technologies. And so if there is a law or a policy about privacy, that might change my access control system or what kind of data I collect and who, and who can use it and how it's used. Um, if there is a new standard with cybersecurity, it might change the kind of architecture I have. I might have to add more firewalls or segment things in particular ways. And as we do that, there are many trade-offs to uh, consider. So you really have to think of all of these impacts that our IoT devices and systems 
I have as a whole universe of things, a, a whole universe of things with many trade-offs uh, between the kinds of common good we, goods we want to see. So today what I'd like to do is um, not be so general and really talk a little bit about how hard it is and how complicated it is to focus a product in a system in the common good by looking at uh, one of many people's favorite products uh, in the internet of things and that's self-driving cars. So let's spend some time thinking about um, that amazing beast, the self-driving car. And, um, and so the first thing to ask is how smart is your car? And I will tell you as um, uh, one of us who uh, drives probably the dumbest car you can imagine, uh, my car is not smart. And so the Society of Automotive Engineers have actually ranked different cars based on how much uh, human uh, control you need. Um, at the very bottom, is, um, is cars for which you need complete human control. That would be my 2014 Subaru Impreza. And uh, my car is at the level of zero or one. It has anti-lock brakes and it has cruise control, but it needs me and it needs me all the time. At the highest level is uh, level five cars. And that car, that car doesn't exist yet. That's a self-driving car that needs no human intervention at all. And it can drive everywhere at any time. And that everywhere at any time um, is the part that makes it uh, so far uh, the mythical level five. Um, for you to buy a car with self-driving capabilities, you're probably buying a car at level two or three. And there's some cars that can do some amazing things. They can park themselves and they can change lanes and they can navigate down the highway um, without your intervention, but they expect you to be around. Um, the uh, industry is now building cars at the levels of three and four. And so those are cars that you see in the ride sharing services and cars you see for, uh, you know, self-driving trucks that are platooning in California um, to, do, um, to do that kind of activity. So you see things kind of all across the spectrum. Um, so what do, how, how do self-driving cars work? And, and they're also called connected autonomous vehicles. So, so you'll see me say CAV every, every once in a while. And a CAV is basically, uh, at least today, what we know is a car with two kinds of components, components that see and components that model and analyze. And um, these cars drive pretty much the way you and I drive. They sense their environment, they plan what they're gonna do and they act. And they do that all in a fraction of a second, just like we do. And so they have to figure out where they are, where they're going, what all those things uh, are around them, how are they gonna get there? And then they have to actuate uh, driving in the car. And so, um, and so let's just look at the sensors and the sensors are really fascinating. Um, when you look at a self-driving car, what you find is um, many redundant kinds of sensors. And these sensors use light, they use radio waves, they use sound waves, they use inertial movement, um, they use GPS, they use all kinds of things um, to pretty much figure out what they're, what they're dealing with and what they're seeing around them. The reason why they use so many systems is that each system has different benefits and liabilities and ranges and errors. So when you use them in combination, they allow the car to sense their environment in a robust way that minimizes the weaknesses of each particular sensor. And that's really important because robustness is gonna be an incredibly important part of the algorithmic and computational uh, features of these cars. Of course, um, a video is worth a thousand words. I guess a video is worth a million words. And um, so let me borrow a little clip from uh, Chris Ermson's TED Talk to show you what a self-driving car actually has to deal with. And um, as you see, you're on the road and there's all kinds of things around you. Uh, some things are moving, some things are not moving. You have to anticipate where they're gonna be going at what rate. Um, uh, some of them are cars, some of them are trucks, some of them are running stoplights, some of them are doing things in unanticipated ways, um, turning left from the right lane or jaywalking or doing all kinds of things. The self-driving car has to anticipate what that thing in the road is. Is that a police person who's um, uh, 
looking at traffic and trying to figure out you know, how to manage people. Is it a pedestrian? Is it a dog uh, in the road? Is it a box? Um, they have to figure out where the construction is um, and what they might have to drive around. They have to do this in all kinds of driving conditions and they have to do that um, whether, whether all of the other objects are doing um, things they expect for them to do or things that they don't expect uh, them to do. Um, by comparison, if you think about a self-driving car, it typically has about 100 million lines of code. And by comparison, if you think about an airplane, um, which has uh, largely autonomous ways of navigating through the air, that has only the Boeing Dreamliner 787, for example, has only about six and a half million lines of code. And the fact is a self-driving car, it's harder to develop the program for a self-driving car than it is for an airplane, because there's so many more things it's likely to come in contact with um, at much shorter amounts of time, um, et cetera. And so, um, so the fact that we can create self-driving cars that can navigate the road in any way, shape or form is kind of miraculous. And it's not as if we haven't had um, accidents. Some of them have been fatal, about a half dozen have been fatal uh, with self-driving cars, but they're getting better and better every year. And the prediction is that by 2050, 2060, um, all of the cars on the road will be self-driving cars and we will not be driving anymore. So that's an interesting thing to start thinking about. Now, I wanna get back to this notion of impact universe now that we know a little bit of uh, something about self-driving cars um, and really think about, you know, as we roam around and look at all of the implications of what these things can do, um, what about the environmental impacts? And a really key question here is how do we make self-driving cars sustainable? And, um, and so let's think about that a little bit. And typically um, we have a number of different strategies that we use for sustainability. Um, one uh, very well-known strategy is to reduce emissions. And there's two ways of doing that. You can do that through the hardware of the car or you could do that through how the car is driven. In the hardware, uh, there's more and more of a focus on building energy efficient cars. Typically that means that um, people are looking at the aerodynamics of the car, but it also means they're looking at whether they're fuel injected or plug in electric um, uh, batteries. One of the things you may or may not have seen is that um, GM just announced that by 2035, all of its cars um, would, be, uh, would be electric cars. And in fact, uh, Ford just announced it's putting a tremendous amount of money between now and 2025 into uh, self-driving cars and, um, and energy efficient cars. Um, the software is a really interesting way we can make these cars more efficient. And um, for um, those of us who grew up without self-driving cars, that meant good driving. So if you remember, you went to driver training and drivers tra in driver's training, they told you um, don't ride the brake, um, don't gun the car. Uh, and and it's, that's bad driving, but it also uh, increases emissions. And so eco-driving means that we want our self-driving cars to really understand how to smoothly accelerate, smoothly decelerate, not to idle too long, and to do all of those things that are really gonna cut the emissions. And, and developing the algorithms to do that is really useful and really important. We're designing these cars for sustainability. And you really have to think about focusing on the entire automotive life cycle. So for example, um, you, uh, it, you need to think about the emissions when you're actually manufacturing the car. And you need to think about the end of life for the car. And so these days in a normal, not self-driving car, about 80% of the car is recycled. But now when we have all, all kinds of extra sensors and computers and cameras on it, we wanna make sure that can be recycled or repurposed as well. Um, today, the amount of e-waste on the planet is mounting at about 50 million tons a year, additional tons a year. And you know, uh, we see um, landfills that are now getting filled with you know, cell phone parts and, and computers that might be used in cars and other kinds of IoT devices and stuff like that. And that's not a, a good direction. And so what we wanna do is recycle and repurpose 
as many of the cameras and components uh, from these cars as possible. And it will say, take some time to figure out the right materials and the right architectures for that. Um, this graph kind of shows you that whatever set of choices you make, you're gonna get some trade-offs. And so if you have a, a car that uh, does well at eco-driving and platooning, so now you're driving smoothly together, very close to one another, algorithms can handle it. Um, you're de-emphasizing performance for sustainability and good driving. Um, your algorithm is not interested in gunning your car to show off. So uh, this is a good thing. And, um, and so we have lots of things like uh, improved crash avoidance. Uh, we're making vehicles smaller. We're jettisoning some of the safety equipment and making the materials lighter. Um, that reduces emissions. Um, but that also means that more people will be able to be in cars. And I might use uh, my car for ways that I don't use it now. It means that people who don't drive now can use these cars successfully, children and the elderly and uh, people with disabilities who can't drive. You might use this car to travel a much farther distance because you don't have to drive in the car. You can visit, you can have a meal, you can watch a movie, you can sleep, you can do all kinds of things. So you, now you might use a self-driving car uh, instead of a plane or a train. And so what we're finding is that some of these things are going to reduce emissions, but some of these things are gonna create greater use and they're gonna uh, uh, create emissions. And of course, when we have to think about um, promoting the common good and the development of this, you know, in a way we have to think about which common good, which of the common goods that we'd like to promote um, should have priorities. And that's part of the challenge of actually developing these things. One thing that you might find a little surprising um, is that uh, self-driving cars are really going to change the built environment. And what that means is that if we think about land use and population density and highways and parking and you know how, how often we choose to travel and what we do in cars, all of those will change. Um, this picture of parking is, uh, is a, a, a parking lot that has become standard in New York City. Um, your car may actually have a higher tier uh, than your apartment. And in fact, about 30% of cities these days in, in big urban areas is devoted to parking, on-street parking, parking like this, uh, parking underground. And when we have self-driving cars, we may not need this. Um, if the self-driving car is a service, it'll drop you off and go pick somebody else up. Uh, if it's your car or, or it doesn't, or it needs to park, it can park in someplace much farther away than right close to your office. And so we're gonna see really a different way to urbanize and a different kind of population density. And that's gonna be one of those impacts in the impact universe of self-driving cars. And we're gonna to have to think about that as we move on. Okay, um, so let's think about some of the, let's roam around some more in the impact universe of self-driving cars and think a little bit about the social effects. And of course, the most important uh, thing for all of us is, and the car manufacturers is, how do we make self-driving cars safe and secure? And, um, and so typically car manufacturers have looked at two ways of making cars safe. Those are passive safety and active safety. In passive safety, you make the hardware of the car safe. Uh, you put a bumper on it, or uh, you make it out of certain materials that you think will uh, withstand accidents, or you add seat belts uh, and airbags and other kinds of things. But when we start thinking about uh, connected autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, those designs are expected to be lighter and smaller a lot of the time. And they are, are likely to have less safety equipment because we expect those cars, uh, we expect that in general, we will have fewer accidents in those cars. And so we expect them to look different. And some of them might even look like the pods and the Jetsons. Um, people are exploring flying cars and all kinds of things we wouldn't even expect. So in 2050, the roadways are gonna look a lot different. Um, but active safety is really gonna be the game changer. Active safety is when you make the operation of the car safe. And you and I don't operate that car anymore. 
the algorithms operate the car. And so how robust those algorithms are, what kinds of errors that those algorithms have, you want, uh, you want errors that don't make so much of a difference rather than catastrophic errors, um, cybersecurity and all of those will be really important. And of course, there's been a lot of discussion about um, when cars have to make bad choices. You know, who do you kill? The trolley problem kind of um, thing. And even though that's a pretty simplistic version of uh, the bad choice problem, um, it's, a, it's a problem that's gonna face cars and they're going to have to have an algorithmic way of dealing with that. And that's, that's, that will challenge us for some time. Um, one of the things that, uh, that, those car, that will make those cars more vulnerable rather than less vulnerable is the need for cybersecurity. And if you think about it, um, a self-driving car is really a computer that drives. And if you think about all the ways that you can attack a computer and all the vulnerabilities a computer has, it's really not something you wanna see on the road. Um, you can attack the passwords or the network protocols or have a denial of service attack, or uh, you can't deal with a network outage or the information isn't secure. Um, it can be hijacked. A few years ago, there was a high profile um, demonstration for a journalist who was riding in a Jeep uh, by white hat hackers that basically ran him off the road from several miles away. They got in through the infotainment system and they were able to turn on the radio really high and windshield wipers and um, basically kind of stop his car while he, he got it off the road. Um, they were doing that to demonstrate to him uh, just how vulnerable these cars can be and, and those fixes got patched, but, uh, and he was okay. Um, but you can imagine how difficult um, these kinds of challenges will be for car manufacturers, because uh, what we don't want, uh, we will not be using uh, self-driving cars uh, if, they are, if they are not uh, reasonably safe for us. Um, another thing that um, we often don't think about is what about the privacy of, of you and your car? Uh, other than my cell phone, which comes with me in my car, uh, you know, my Subaru is a pretty safe place. It's not listening to what I'm saying. It's not picking up uh, for the most part where I'm going. Uh, it's, it's just dumb. And, um, but in these cars with more smarts, a lot of personal data is often collected about you, where you go, where you are, what you're doing, what you listen to. Uh, you know, what you're doing with the screen. So that means your phone calls and your texts and your website queries, um, your favorites of the routes and the stopovers, how you drive, your biometrics, etc. cetera. And, um, and so one question is, you know, these, and, and that is not regulated at this point in time, like a lot of other consumer data collected about us, um, the rights and the ownership of that data is with the car company. And so the question is, you know, what kind of protections do we need to make sure that these cars are going to be safer and that our privacy is protected uh, in these cars? And the car industry have, has been thinking about that for quite some time. And there's a lot of interesting discussion about the kind of policy and oversight that's needed. It means that um, we are going to have to think about how we collect, use, and share personal information. Now note that some of the personal information I give it, um, it needs for operation. It needs to know where I'm gonna go um, to operate. And, uh, and so I have to figure out when um, the car company, or we have to create policy that says when things that we collect for operation are only used for operation. And, and when we have some control over what's collected otherwise um, and how the car company might use it. This also means that uh, when we do have some sort of guidelines uh, and policy about the privacy of personal information in a self-driving car, we need some way of monitoring and enforcing and making accountable um, those who are collecting the information. So um, this is really a brave new world like, like a lot of this stuff for all of us. And when we think about safety and security and privacy, all of these things make a big difference in terms of the kinds of impacts 
that self-driving cars will have on our world and our, on our society. Um, let me just say that um, for those of us who are data scientists and computer scientists, there is a wealth of fascinating problems um, that come from trying to get the technology right and to promote the common good. Um, decades and years and centuries of work for us to do and, um, and exciting work for us to do, important work for us to do. Um, for those of us studying algorithms, different ways of eco-driving, image classification, feature detection, and all of those things that make us understand what's around us, um, how they're moving, what to do with them, uh, really important. Robustness and accuracy of these algorithms and ways to minimize catastrophic error is going to be critical. Um, ethics is a tremendous area and an area we, we don't even have our heads around yet in terms of how we develop these algorithms and what's the ethics of these outcomes, what should the ethics be, whose ethics, uh, etc. When we think about the system architectures for these algorithms, it means we are trying to think about designing them with cybersecurity in mind, with privacy in mind, and with the computational and power requirements of CAV systems in mind. You know, how much information do I need to send over the internet to other cars in my platoon or, or to sensors uh, that are external uh, and otherwise? And there's more. Um, for those of us really interested in computational modeling and simulation, accurate models and parameter estimates are, are really critical to think about the impacts on the environment, our economic projections, our workforce needs, energy savings, and all manner of things. And of course, in an area that I've spent a long time working in, data stewardship and preservation, cyber infrastructure and use, all of our strategies are really important here. You know, who collects and who preserves this information? Um, how do we make it available to researchers and to those who need to do analysis? Um, how do we do open science and reproducible research on CO CAVs? And that's really important because a lot of the data, especially data on level four cars, for example, are being connect collected by private company and it's their competitive advantage. And so if we want the community to be able to thinking about and using it and doing open science on it, we have to think of good ways for that to happen. So lots of problems for us to work on for sure. And these are just cars. Um, let me just sort of um, end our, our um, short roam around the impact universe with talking about some economic implications, because, you know, as with other things, these create some of the many trade-offs that we're going to see as well. And, and let's just look at three questions that people often ask. Uh, number one, who will lead the automotive industry, who will work in the automotive industry, and third, what new jobs and services will be needed? And so let's, let's think a little bit about market leadership. And that might not be something that we typically think about as computer scientists, but it's gonna make a tremendous difference uh, in terms of what people do. And if you think about it, there's kind of a struggle right now for market leadership between traditional automotive companies who think of these cars by and large as cars with smart systems and technology companies who by and large think of these cars as smart systems with driving hardware. And, and there's a lot of hybrid partnerships uh, in addition. And if you think about it, um, why that matters is because these industries operate with really different cultures. And in many cases, different laws apply to them. And when we start thinking about the future and the economics of self-driving cars, who leads uh, the market will matter and how that market evolves matters and how that market evolves and how that impacts the common good matters. And so market leadership is something to keep our eyes on. Um, one of the things there's been a lot of discussion about is workforce evolution. Not surprisingly, self-driving cars will bring fewer drivers. And um, so tests in California are showing that if you have trucks and they're platooning along a highway, which is, is, is something that uh, most self-driving systems do pretty well on, and then they get to a part where there's some last mile delivery and often humans uh, you know, take uh, the ball then. Um, we'll see a lot more of that, especially um, while we're developing autonomous last mile delivery solutions. 
the auto industry workforce is going to change too. And we'll see a lot more roboticists and material scientists, computer scientists, engineers um, than we've seen in the past. And so um, some jobs are going away and, and new jobs are happening and other jobs are happening and businesses will change. And so some of the most interesting changes will come from who actually owns these cars. And now most of us uh, who, who uh, travel, uh, uh, or many of us anyway, own cars, private ownership. And there's um, some public tra uh, transportation and an increasing amount of ride sharing options. Um, but in 2050, 2060, when these cars are ubiquitous, um, there, it may actually be mostly ride sharing. If you think about the way we do air travel, there is no public air travel. And uh, very few of us, uh, not me, own our, own our own plane. And so most of us um, are, are using a highly regulated private se sector industry that keep us in the air. And it may be true that vehicle travel is like that as well. We don't know, but um, that's one of the things we're thinking about in terms of economic impacts. It means a whole slew of, of um, industries that work with um, automotive dealers and, and autos uh, will change. Our insurance, uh, rather than having car owner insurance, I might have car renter, uh, something that looks much more like car renter insurance. Um, auto dealerships and maintenance and repair might work with companies instead of individuals. We'll think about delivery and long haul transportation differently. And we'll see expanded and new uses for uh, CAVs. There might be auto concierge uh, services that host your next party in a CAV or entertainment services. Um, a, a sort of chilling possibility in the face of um, little uh, protections is uh, dynamic surveillance. So think about the, all those Google Earth cars taking uh, pictures of uh, different people's homes to, uh, to put on Google Earth. There's no reason we can't have dynamic surveillance ser uh, uh, services where a self-driving car will roam around and for whatever purposes is needed, uh, surveil, surveil people or things or, or activities. And so, you know, all of these will have social implications and all of them has implications for the way we think about these, the way we create our laws, the way we create um, these systems and devices. So um, this was just a sort of a quick uh, roam through the impact universe of self-driving cars. But of course, this isn't really about cars at all. Um, there's an impact universe of smart refrigerators um, that will affect us in many ways. Imagine throwing that in the landfill. Um, there's an impact universe of smart insulin pumps where cybersecurity uh, and all of these things make a tremendous difference. Um, and all of these really give us uh, an impact universe of a variety of systems and devices um, where we're gonna have to think really hard and really holistically about how to deal with all the trade-offs to promote the common good. So um, let me just finish the talk with a ray of hope. Uh, where do we go from here? Um, and as we've seen, uh, impact universe has many competing strategies and goals. And, and we ourselves are gonna to have to figure out what's most important in various uh, environments and, and how are we gonna balance all of the trade-off. Um, and you know, um, one, uh, one thing that we saw, this kind of gives you just a bit of an example, you know, it might be uh, my goal for the common good to make cars more sustainable. And, um, and that's uh, reasonably consistent with making cars lighter. I can make cars lighter, I can make cars um, out of uh, more sustainable materials. Um, but if I make cars lighter, um, it may be that all of these right-sized light cars uh, that are traveling in platoons uh, with each other uh, in 2050 um, really reduce the number of accidents for everyone. But for any given accident we do have, they may be might more, much more severe. Um, the car is light, uh, I'm traveling closely with someone, and it doesn't necessarily make the car safer. Making the car safer would be to build a tank. Um, and so uh, it's not possible to sort of turn all of these dials to max at the same time. We are gonna have to make trade-offs and, and we need a lot of smart thinking 
and a lot of thoughtfulness in terms of how we do that. And um, the good news is that it's not one sector's job. It's not industry, it's not government, it's, it's really all of our jobs. And I have some, some thoughts about how we might look at that in different sectors just for the next few slides. So in my opinion, um, the government needs to take the lead in protecting the public. Without oversight, you know, tech can get out of control. Innovation is cool. And we need the um, social course corrections and controls to be able to make that tech safe and secure and, and protective of us. That means that like a lot of bills that are still in, in committee in Congress, um, we can legislate consumer protections and personal data protections and uh, various safety and security standards. Um, we can begin to think as a nation about guidelines for ethical development and use and outcomes. And that, and that means not just as an industry, but really as a nation. And we see a lot of that happening in the EU with some of the groups thinking about self-driving cars and other kinds of AI and autonomous systems. Um, one of the things we need is clarity. When something goes wrong, who's responsible? Who's accountable? Who's liable for this? And so we need all kinds of laws that now extend to these IoT devices. You know, who goes to jail? The programmer, the CEO, uh, is the company fine? You know, what happens? And, um, and, you know, as Eric Learned Miller said yesterday in the panel we were on, um, the, the US government has good uh, a precedent for doing these kinds of things. The FDA, as he pointed out, um, was developed to protect our food and drugs. Um, if you think about it, OSHA was developed to protect our workplaces. If you work with asbestos, OSHA says that um, your employer needs to provide uh, equipment that keeps you safe. And so the US government has experience with creating these, you must be at least this tall to ride kind of legislation and agencies. And it's really important for us to have these uh, in, the in the digital world we live in. Um, one of the things that the government can do is regulate the private sector. And when they do, it unleashes a huge amount of innovation because um, uh, businesses then can spend time thinking about focusing on um, public interest focused design, environmentally focused design, um, and design that really promotes the common good. They can, they can focus more on responsible practice, how we create sustainable supply chains and explainability of the algorithms and risk mitigation. And they can focus on transparency about the risks and benefits. Um, if you think about going to the grocery store, um, we feel like our food is reasonably protected. And we go to the drugstore and we feel that our drugs had to pass muster in some way uh, in order for us to be able to buy them. And, you know, do I feel that good? Do I feel as good about uh, all of the software I use uh, as I do about my apples or my Tylenol? Right now, I don't. And right now, we don't necessarily have the protections we need for all of that. And so um, one of the things that we can do is really understand when it's safe or not and, and have businesses help us by uh, providing uh, that information. Uh, as citizens, um, we often feel kind of overwhelmed by all of this. And, and um, understandably, we can't do big things, but we can do some small things that help. We can make informed choices. We cannot buy baby monitors that don't let us change the password. Uh, we can protect our personal data. We can use two-phase authentication. Those things are little, uh, little things we can do, but they'll stop some of the misbehavior, uh, not all of it. Um, and we can promote public responsibility. We can care about this. And we can provide feedback when the government asks for our opinion for something uh, that they're thinking about. Uh, there's lots of venues for public opinion. And of course, you know, we've just been through a presidential election. And if you think about the gazillion candidates in the pri uh, primary, um, they all had ideas about technology. And uh, when I voted, it was really important to look at um, my candidates' preferred uh, interest on net neutrality or on data privacy or on Internet of Things or cybersecurity and all of those kinds of things. So we can do a little bit as consumers. Um, 
And uh, I think importantly for this group, in higher education, we can do something as well. If you think about it, tech literacy has become the general education requirement for 21st century citizenship and professional work. And as academics, we're trusted parties to build awareness and particularly awareness about the interplay of society and technology. And one of the things that's happening in universities uh, all around the country is we're starting to see vanguard programs in public interest technology. These are really important programs. They make sure that our students have the knowledge and the experience to be thoughtful citizens and good professionals and to understand enough about tech to be able to make good decisions, uh, both in their lives now and when they go forward in the future, and to think about the societal strategies that really do promote the common good. And so some, that's something that we all can do. And I think that's something that um, universities in particular have a special opportunity on. And with that, I really wanna thank you for your attention and, um, and for inviting me to talk today. So thank you so much, Fran. That was that was absolutely awesome. If we could all clap, we would all be absolutely clapping now. But thanks on behalf of everybody. A number of people have been posting questions during your talk. So remember, there's a there's a Q and A button uh, down at the bottom, and we're going to be um, we're going to be moderating that uh, now. And actually, maybe I'll start that again after thanking you yet again for really. Uh, really thought provoking talk because a lot of the questions actually come back to the big question of promoting the common good uh, that you were talking about at the end. So let me, I, I've got a few of my own, but I think we really, I want to encourage other folks to add more uh, additional uh, questions that we can address to Fran. But let me get started. Um, uh, the first ones really started showing up when you were talking about uh, cars and car data. And so, um, the first question that came in, uh, I'll, I'll read it to you or excerpt it. My 2021 car and its manufacturer track every movement and location. Uh, I can attest to that being told how fast I drive uh, when I went brought my car in for repair. Uh, that information is potentially very valuable to a lot of companies, um, but not likely in my best and consumer's best interest for the companies, uh, um, for those companies to actually get my data. How do I deal with the perverse incentives and power imbalance that may cause the stewards of my data to use it against me? Do we need government intervention? I might add, and, and, and maybe you, you heard this on your NPR station about Massachusetts, you know, we had a, a, a ballot question last November about whether manufacturers had to share data that they could gather wirelessly with um, other repairs and, and, and you know, uh, the state voted in favor of that. So anyway, the questions about data, privacy, data being used in ways that maybe you can't control. Yeah, this is a great question. And, um, and this is a place where I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and it's familiar for us through um, other kinds of devices and systems that collect our data and use it without, um, without alerting us, without asking us, uh, um, and without giving us any kind of control. Um, the interesting thing about a car is some of the data that your car collects, uh, it actually needs for operation. And I think as we start thinking about various kinds of policy and regulation, which I do believe we do need regulation here, um, I think we have to figure out um, which of the information is needed for operation of the car which of uh, the uh, information is needed kind of like for black box scenarios. If something goes wrong, um, you know, it helps us kind of like debug algorithms for the future or ways that we can uh, protect ourselves. Um, which of that information um, could be sold or used to advantage someone who wants to advertise to you, uh, someone who wants to know what you're doing in ways that you don't want them to know what you're doing, et cetera. And I think as we tease apart all of those um, different uses for information, we absolutely need some regulation about um, the un, uh, uh, unapproved use of private data um, by car manufacturers 
um, uh, by the people in them. And, and, and in a car, you actually get lots of things. I mean, you have these cameras and the cameras are taking pictures of bystanders. So if I'm in the car and the car is driving, um, I can give the car permission to take the data uh, that it uses. But what about the bystander? You know, can that be used in a, a court of law against them? They were at such and such a place at such and such a time because, you know, Fran's car camera actually figured that out. And so I think we have to tease apart all of those different things. And I think now there's no incentive for car companies to actually um, provide us that, that kind of control. I think the government has to level the playing field and take that away as a, as a competitive advantage for us to really get at a place where we have more control over it. Oh, I can't hear you, Jim. You so Fran, another question. Uh, that came in actually had to do with the uh, the question of incentives, and these are incentives for car companies now, right? And so, uh, you know, you probably heard the term planned obsolescence. And so, uh, the question had to do with, well, gee, you know, uh, if we're if we're thinking about these autonomous vehicles, don't the um, don't the car companies sort of have incentives to limit, uh, you know, the lifetime of a car or um, you know, to encourage, um, you know, additional purchases in the future. So again, speaking to this issue of, uh, of incentives, this time from the manufacturer's point of view. Yeah, and, um, and uh, you know, we don't even know what the lifetime of these cars are. And so uh, I guess the statistic I heard, um, and uh, pardon me if it's not right, is that it's about, uh, we think about the cars we own as lasting about 15 years. And um, recently, uh, the CEO of one of these car companies said that they thought that self-driving cars used in ride-sharing mode, um, because, because we park our cars about 95% of the time, but one of these self-driving cars used in ride-sharing mode might only be used for four years. And so you can imagine that we're not even sure what the lifetime of these cars are. Now, if you think about your smartphone, they're dying for you to buy a, a new smartphone as often as possible. And they do all kinds of crazy things with, you know, the battery doesn't last long enough and, um, and, uh, and the upgrades don't necessarily work with, you know, all of your apps and this kind of thing. Um, you know, for cars, we've seen a little bit more robustness because, uh, you know, in some sense, people don't want to necessarily, uh, some people want to buy a new car every year, but most of us don't want to buy a new car every year. And, but I do think it's, it, it's going to change a little bit when these cars become, there's sort of less personal interest in these cars and more commercial interest in these cars. And I think that's going to make things change. But, you know, these kinds of questions about sort of predicting the future require us to really understand so much more about how they're going to be used and what they're going to be made of and, you know, who's going to be driving them and who's going to be owning them. And, and that's part of why predicting um, the impacts of these things is so hard. Nonetheless, it's really important to do. Uh -huh. so, so, you know, when you, when you predict, you look backwards and then you predict forward sort of based on the past. And, and another question that came in had to do with the question of, of, of um, something you said early on. So you said technology leads and society eventually course corrects. History teaches us that. Um, so that's that's really optimistic, and that's it's it, it's <laughs> wonderful. Maybe it's almost Pollyanna-esque, if that's a if if that's a word. And and the question had to do with the speed of innovation. And and you know, if you look back in the in the 1800s, um, it took a while for technology to percolate, but now it happens so quickly. And and the question had to do with maybe just asking you to reflect on the speed of innovation and whether this notion of technology leading and then society correcting works when the time cycles are too short, the horse is already out of the barn. Yeah, and um, I I'm not gonna cheer you up here uh, because even in the industrial revolution, some of these laws took you know, 30, 40 years to, to really happen. And so, you know, and, and, and the innovation was at a much different level then. Um, I, I do think that innovation goes quickly. And, um, and you know, uh, we have not been quick about providing um, the protections that we need. 
And I think that that is going to be exacerbated. But, you know, it's kind of like, what choice do we have? Um, throwing up our hands, like for me, is, is not a good solution to these problems. And, and these are problems that we are going to continue to have. Now, um, we talked yesterday on the panel on, on really, you know, how can you make people care and, and what makes these things happen? And my own observation is that a lot of times things happen more quickly when something catastrophic happens. Uh, you know, people get scared, you know, somebody dies, uh, you know, uh, data breaches where everybody loses social security numbers or, um, you know, various things happen or somebody gets killed because somebody hacked a pacemaker or, or ran a car off the road. Um, so then we start seeing these things and um, but hopefully, uh, you know, we can also do the things where we're sort of thinking about this responsibly and starting to get these things through. And with some of these IoT devices like self-driving cars, we've now had enough experience that we can actually talk about the fact that we need to collect data. California is the only state um, that really requires that we collect and only certain kinds of data about self-driving cars. We don't even know, you know, how many, I can't even answer the question, will we, ha are we having more accidents in self-driving cars than non-self-driving normal cars? Because you don't have the numerator and the denominator of both of those things. And so, you know, so there's a lot of stuff for us to be done, but um, no, I think, I think technology going quickly is going to be a problem, and I think we have to like, keep at it anyway. Okay, you mentioned equity, and actually we have a couple of questions that, that touch on this issue. So uh, I'll, I'll read the first one. Hi, Fran. It's from somebody you know. Uh, Hi. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm working with an urban district that actually has a, a, a population of white students of less than 10% to introduce K-5 students to computer science and computational thinking. Uh, we're hoping to empower them to create a more equitable world of technology. And so what would you say to them about IoT design? You know, again, thinking about K through five students, thinking about computational thinking, thinking about um, uh, an equitable world of technology. What would you say to them about IoT design creation and policy? Um, I think that's a really good question, and um, I got a different version of this uh, the last time I gave this talk, which was International Women's Day, which was like last week, um, which was talking about the equity of who has access to these vehicles, and I think they're both really interesting questions. Let me answer your question. Um, you know, I don't know, how do you explain things to a kindergarten? I mean, uh, a lot of those kindergartners want to go to Disneyland, and they want to ride a roller coaster. And there's a sign at the roller coaster that says, you have to be this high to ride this roller coaster. And they may be shorter or taller than the sign. Um, but you know, why do they have that sign? And the sign is that the roller coaster was constructed so it's, that it's safest for a certain um, height of person, a height and weight probably of person. And, um, and it's not so safe for people smaller than that. It's probably not so safe for people way taller than that, but there's uh, fewer of those. And so what you say to the kindergartner is um, the purpose of good design and good rules are to make people safe. It, it doesn't make people safe in 100% of the time, but one of the things we wanna do is we make, wanna make sure we design a device that makes you safe and that doesn't hurt you. And, uh, and we wanna make sure that there's rules where the government says, um, you, can't, you can't do that because we don't wanna hurt our people. And that I think kids can understand because they do understand safety, they understand security um, in their own way. Okay, great. So uh, we have another question also related to equity. Uh, I'll read parts of that. So, hi, Dr. Berman, thanks for a uh, your really interesting and timely talk. Um, I have a question about deploying this technology in an equity-based way. The groups you mentioned benefiting most from this, this was about CAVs, um, people with disabilities, children don't have the capital to get this technology. And so this is sort of about the initial and intermediate phase of deployment. Um, they don't have the capital to get this uh, technology. If we look at the current trend, cars with some of these additional safety features are among the most expensive. Yeah, I think that's a really good comment. And that kind of, um, 
that kind of doubles with the other comment I got, which is, you know, these are really expensive cars, you know, like normal people uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, can't afford them. And I think that's true now. I mean, right now, a lot of the self-driving cars, you know, um, that you can buy as a person, the more souped up it is likely, the more uh, expensive it is. Um, but there's two things going on that I think are really interesting for the, this question. Number one, I think you're starting to see a lot more public transportation um, that is uh, incorporating these self-driving capabilities. And I think we'll see that more and more. And so um, while we have public transportation and who knows uh, you know, what, what that trajectory will be, I think um, we will see more that has these uh, capabilities and, uh, and, and stuff like that. Um, I think, and the second thing is, I think that you get the trickle down effect. And so, you know, the next time I buy a car, it's much less, uh, uh, you know, I think if you buy a new car now um, at all ends of the spectrum, they have more of these capabilities of autonomous driving or, you know, watching the other lane or, you know, maybe it isn't all of the fancy stuff souped up and Elon Musk isn't sending you the updated program every two to four weeks. But it may be that, uh, you know, if I bought a car now, if I bought a new car now, um, it would be have much more capability than my car now. So I think some of those things um, without active intervention are things that will sort of happen, you know, in the next uh, five to 10 years for sure. Yeah, and I think that's a, a really good comment about uh, public transportation in particular, because, um, you know, with trickle down, it is the early adopters, it tends to be expensive, but public transportation and smart and connected communities and cities, for example, is a way in which this technology is widely deployed for the public good. That's right, you should have answered this question. You know more <laughs> from the NSF you, than anyone. Just reflecting on your answer. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so we're about at the end of our time. Um, and, and so I wanna again, thank you for really just a marvelous talk. I, I, I want you to know, I don't think anybody left the entire time uh, that you were talking that that's really uh, pretty good because uh, it was a really wonderful talk and I think really spoke to you know the role that we all have as researchers as educators um, uh, in a in a technology in a technology area and it clearly resonates with uh, everybody who was here I think it also resonates with the theme for this symposium and the theme for our college as a whole about computing for the common good. So uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for speaking so eloquently about something that so many people here feel so passionate about. Well, um, thank you and thank everyone. And I wanna remind everyone that Jim will be talking this afternoon, uh, not to be missed talk. And so, uh, so you should be sure and go to that as well. Well, Fran, you're an incredibly hard act to follow. Uh, <laughs> So what we're going to do now, um, we're going to start the research, uh, uh, the research uh, talks at at 1:30. We're going to give every time everybody a chance to take a short break here. We're going to keep the webinar up uh, and running during this time, uh, and then we'll all reconvene at 1:30 for the faculty research talks. So, Fran, thank you again, and thanks to everybody for the for the questions, and we'll see you shortly back again at 1:30 Eastern Standard Time.